Hi, I'm Jude from HeadFi.org, and today Sennheiser is launching a new in-ear monitor called the Sennheiser IE300, and I'm excited about it for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's an outstanding IEM for just $300, and of course, that's the main reason for this video, and I'll get to that in a minute or so. But also, it's just exciting to see Sennheiser's focus on the audiophile category continue a decades-long tradition that a couple of years ago, I have to admit, I was actually starting to wonder about. At the last couple of CESs where Sennheiser exhibited, they showed a much greater focus on things like augmented reality sound and 3D audio than they did on audiophile products. Then, somewhere in that time, one of the wizards behind many of Sennheiser's legendary headphones, Axel Grell, left Sennheiser to start his own consultancy. On top of those things, Sennheiser's longer product cycles have always made it a bit challenging to get an outside read on their audiophile product plans. So around a year and a half ago, I pretty much invited myself to Sennheiser's headquarters to see what was going on, and I spent a couple of days there. Long story short, after that visit, I was left feeling very encouraged about Sennheiser's commitment to the audiophile category now and in the years ahead. Jarmo Kunka and Rania Harsta in Sennheiser's audiophile product team and Sennheiser's engineering teams shared with me a long look forward, discussed audio test and measurement, and they shared some truly incredible manufacturing technologies that Sennheiser developed and that they're using that involve real-time test and measurement used in ways I hadn't seen before that. Now, while most of that information and my photos and videos of it remains confidential, I do hope to be able to share more about it with you in the future. And that brings me back to the Sennheiser IE300 that's launching right now. The 7mm dynamic driver inside this Sennheiser IE300 that's launching today is manufactured at Sennheiser's headquarters in one of those very advanced production lines I was talking about just a moment ago. For the IE300, Sennheiser is using a refined version of their 7mm Extra Wideband or XWB transducer. It's said they optimize the membrane foil to minimize natural resonances and total harmonic distortion. I have no details about the membrane beyond that, but the IE300's THD is certainly worth discussing and we will get to that shortly. Now before I go any further about the IE300, I feel I have to mention one of the more recently released IEMs from Sennheiser that I consider a clear sonic sibling and predecessor to the IE300, even though there are some substantial differences in their overall designs, which I'll get to shortly. I'm referring to the Sennheiser IE400 Pro. The IE400 Pro is part of Sennheiser's professional audio lineup released a couple of years ago. While developed for the pro audio market, the IE400 Pro has been very well regarded in the audiophile community for its sound and understandably so. As I've mentioned in past videos, I feel that neutral isn't one particular signature, but really more of a range. There's a range of neutrality, and the IE400 Pro would be within that range. If its tonal balance is considered by some to be U-shaped or V-shaped, it would be very mildly so by any reasonable definition in my book. I found the IE400 Pro's bass to be on the thicker side of neutral. It's treble detailed, but maybe with just enough zest to earn the right side of the V or U shape that some describe, but only just. There is no mistaking that the two, the IE400 Pro and the new IE300, are related, and you can hear it. They both use Sennheiser 7mm dynamic drivers. They both use transducer back volumes, very carefully designed to minimize reflections within their housings. And they both use resonator chambers or acoustic absorbers, essentially Hemholtz resonators, to dampen unwanted resonances, to dampen masking resonances when worn. With the IE300, though, Sennheiser's engineers completely redesigned this mechanism, going from two small resonators in the nozzle pathway, as used in the IE400 Pro and the IE800, to one larger resonator that, instead of being in the nozzle, is outside of it as a side volume connected via a slit. Now, if you're wondering why these absorber slash resonator chambers are used, it's because with them you can address specific peaks. They can be more precisely tuned than, say, traditional dampening foam or other media in front of the driver, which can have a broader, less precise impact or effect. Anyway, this new side volume resonator design and other optimizations allowed them to refine the response of the IE300. And I do think moving the resonators outside of the main pathway of the nozzle likely helped with this. The IE300's treble sounds smoother and more polished, but not at the expense of treble presence or extension that I can hear versus its IE400 Pro sibling. Just as important to me are the refinements Sennheiser brought to the IE300's bass. Compared to the IE400, the Sennheiser IE300's bass was tamed, sounding more controlled and a bit less thick. It's cleaner down low with the IE300, so it sounds a bit faster and more responsive in the bass. With the IE400, there are times I wished for tamer bass, and the IE300 tames it some for sure. One thing about the IE400 I'd prefer they didn't touch was the mid-range, which I've found to be airy, clear, and resolving. And thankfully, to my ears, the IE300 is the IE400's equal there. 
In fact, with the bass and treble refinements, the presentation of the IE300 is overall airier, more controlled, more resolving. They're more alike than different in total, but the differences add up to a significant refinement with the IE300, a sort of distillation of the best things about the IE400, and significant enough to be more than the measurements show. At this point, let's take a look at our measurements of the Sennheiser IE300 made using the Brulencare 5128, which is the most human-like ear simulator standard and what we've transitioned to as our primary headphone measurement fixture. If you want to learn more about the Brulencare 5128, make sure to check the description or the accompanying forum post, and I'll include a link to a video in which I explain the 5128 in some detail. Looking at the frequency response of both the Sennheiser IE300 and the IE400 Pro, since I've already made subjective comparisons of them, looking at these you'll see that again, the measurements also show that they're more alike than they are different. I admittedly expected to see more differences after hearing them. The measurements to me were more similar than I'd have expected them to be upon listening. Now you can see that the bass is indeed less emphasized with the IE300, and maybe it's so effective because though it's a mild reduction, it's applied over a rather wide frequency range. The treble sculpting is also less visually different than I'd have imagined, but then again, the changes in smoothing are in frequencies where most of us are very sensitive. Again, to my ears, these refinements with the IE300 were noticeable and welcome. Looking at the total harmonic distortion, or THD, Sennheiser claims the IE300's THD peaks at a very low 0.08% at 94 decibels. While we did not test at 94 dBSPL because we typically test at 90 decibels, our measurements do suggest that Sennheiser's THD claims will stand up. The IE300's THD at 90 dBSPL peaks at 0.06% at about 3.4 kHz and is under 0.05% pretty much everywhere else in the audio band. What's also noteworthy to me is that the THD ratio is about as flat through the audio band as I've seen from a headphone so far. Now, even at 100 decibels, the THD peaks at around 0.17% at around 41 Hz, but is below that, even well below that through most of the audio band. Again, that's at 100 decibels. Now, for those of you not familiar with total harmonic distortion measurements, let's just say the Sennheiser IE300 has very low distortion throughout the audio band, even at volume levels too loud for me to listen to. Now one other IEM I've been listening to a lot lately is the Westone W60. I used it in one of my headphone measurement videos as an example, and I've kept it with me a lot since. To my ears, the Westone W60 is also within what I call the range of neutrality, but it's certainly different than the IE300. Looking at the measurement comparison, it might look like the IE300 presents with substantially more bass than the W60, but the bass difference doesn't sound nearly as dramatic as it looks. Why? Because you have to look at frequency responses as a whole, and doing so here, you can see the W60 is comparatively shelved in the treble compared to the IE300. So if you've heard the W60, the IE300 is more lively up top. Do I prefer the IE300? Sometimes yes, but I do like the Westone W60 like I like some of my tube amps. It has a lovely bloom to its signature. I've come to really appreciate how the Westone W60's treble comes off as smooth, maybe some would feel it too smooth, and the bass and mids can seem prominent in the mix, but it's an easy listen, but less audiophile reference to me than the Sennheiser IE300. To me, there's no question that the Sennheiser IE300 is definitely the more balanced of the two. So would I change anything about the IE300's tuning? I think many head fires might disagree with me, but given the choice, I'd take a teeny bit of energy out of the bass, a little less bass. When I EQ the IE300, I'm using a 1.5 to 2 decibel shelf to reduce the bass a bit, but most of the time I do listen to it as is. Now I haven't talked about the IE300's design and physical qualities yet, so let's do that now, which will also bring me to one of the other things I'd definitely change about the Sennheiser IE300, which I'll get to momentarily. The Sennheiser IE300 is obviously a concha type cable up design. As you can see in the photos, it's a very low profile design, it's quite slender. So placed in my ears, the IE300's earpieces sit rather deep in the concha, but not deep in the canals, so it's very comfortable. The advantage to this is that they're very low profile in the ears, and if you like to lay your head on a pillow while listening, these work very well for that. The earpiece housings are made of an ABS-PA polymer that was chosen in part for control of unwanted resonances and actually helped with the treble tuning. The IE300 supplied cable is reinforced with paraaramid for durability and flexibility and terminated with a 3.5mm unbalanced plug. 
For additional strain relief, the gold-plated MMCX connectors are seated in recessed 4.8 millimeter wide sockets in the housings. There's no question that the cable build and construction is very nice, very solid, but it has these memory wire ear hooks, and I am definitely not a fan of memory wire ear hooks on any cables, especially ones that can rotate like MMCX terminated cables can, because they can sometimes rotate away from your ears when you do not want them to. Now you can prevent this by tightening the cinch but I'd rather not have the memory wire ear hooks at all and we'll definitely swap these out at some point for an aftermarket cable without them. By the way, Sennheiser will offer balanced cables with 2.5mm and 4.4mm connectors as optional accessories, and the IE300 also comes with an ear tip kit and a very nice compact carrying case. Again, the Sennheiser IE300 should be launching right about now and it will retail for right around 300 US dollars or 300 euros. At its price, I think the Sennheiser IE300 represents a very strong value with a resolving reference type tonal balance that's within my definition of a neutral range and with exceedingly low THD. I've been waiting for this one to be released and it's certainly exceeded my expectations. The IE300 is just one of many things that gives me tremendous confidence that Sennheiser's legacy as an audiophile headphone mark is secure for a long time to come.